This is Christine Howie. I'm a trans woman. I transitioned from Richard 29 years ago in 1985. The poem I'm going to read is titled My Passing, 1988. So many wrong decisions. The too short, acid-washed denim skirt. The metallic blouse. The too high heels. The unfortunate, overly curly wig. Oh, but it all feels so right, all the way into the May Company, until a snarl of teenagers spots me and comes to a halt, their arcing, electric, gum-snapping conversation frozen in midair. Hey, you a man or a woman? Then the giggling. In that split second, I know I'm screwed, totally screwed. I spin back towards the entrance as their keening laughter rips. Hey, faggot, where you going? Now I'm running in the parking lot, carrying my shoes, startling a woman taking her toddler out of a car seat. And once I'm in my car, I burn out of the parking lot, wipers flip to high until I realize the water is in my eyes, not on the windshield. It is one year to the day before I go out again. This time the wig is professionally styled, casual, nothing showy, tan top, black slacks, black flats. This time it's a smaller store, a shoe store, and a strip mall. And after building up my courage in the car for two hours, I walk in, past a woman seated at a table who's talking to some people. But I'm inside. I I'm okay. And turning to look at a display out of the corner of my eye, I see the woman pointing at me as a young guy, another employee, nods at her and walks towards me. Oh, God, here it comes again. I, I whirl to look for the exit, but he's blocking the way, so I speed walk down an aisle. He takes the other aisle and meets me at the end. I open my mouth to apologize, to explain, but he just says, Sorry, ma'am. You walked by so fast you didn't get your gift flower. Here. It's part of our anniversary celebration. And he hands me an artificial peach-colored rose on a green wire stem. Have a nice day, ma'am, he adds with a smile. Weak-kneed, I, I collapse onto a stool and reach out to grab a shoe just to have something to look at. And a woman across from me gives me an odd look, wondering how the plain black loafer in my hand <laughs> inspired the remarkable expression on my face. Holiday Dinner at Mom's, 1970. She meticulously drapes the damask tablecloth, sets the four places with heavy, sparkling silverware that juggles dots of candlelight. She smooths pressed linen napkins as ice cubes chortle in highball glasses. Acknowledging her less than Juliet childlike culinary skills, she relies on corporations for much of the meal flying trusted logos up and down her menu. Iceberg lettuce with Kraft French. Blueberry muffins from Huff Bakery. Stouffer's potatoes au gratin. Green beans by the Jolly Green Giant. And Sarah Lee cheesecake. Her one featured spot is the entree. It is all hers, and invariably, it is meatloaf. That is, quite literally, a loaf of meat. Nothing added. No onion, no celery, no breadcrumbs, no egg, bacon, or spices. This is a five-pound, unmassaged, and non-enhanced dreadnought of ground beef, lowered onto a cookie sheet with the cellophane creases from the grocery store packaging still scoring the top surface, then cooked at 400 degrees for untold hours. Just to be safe so long that the intense heat compresses and compacts the molecules, giving the meat the specific gravity of tungsten. Then at the proper moment, she proudly lifts it out of the oven, steel gray and steaming like a barren atom bomb test atoll in the South Pacific. No waiting pools of Heinz ketchup, 
No thick strata of land o' lakes butter laid on the muffins will enable the swallowing of this arid bovine Armageddon. As dinner progresses, the meat still radiating heat, tucked under a defeated swatch of lettuce, the conversation embroiders bits of news and what Mom has been reading. Principia Mathematica, Toffler and Teilhard de Chardin, explorations into the foundations of math, spasms of the future, the cosmos. I don't understand all of it, of course, but it fascinates me. I keep rereading. And now she's telling us about a Mobius strip, making a model of one over the cheesecake, showing how a surface can have only one side. In these different ways, we are fed. Christine Howey, reading William Randolph Hearst, Diving Alone, San Simeon. He pulls all his heft, hard sauce and cognac, onto the bending board, positions his ramrod stiff arms away from his head, little boy style, palm to palm. When he springs to lift off, looking down he plunges towards dark blue tile, into night sky of waterborne stars, buttery swirls that gleam in his eye. Breaching the surface, a quick head swivel strafes drops across dark ripples, then a flicker of movement. A servant awaits, poolside. Reminds him of constellations he creates anew, illuminated by hand, gold leaf sunk in mosaic, the furled seaweed and fluted shells, all specified, purchased, a world absent surprises, save for those he has commissioned. He receives his shoulder towel, steps into leather slippers, and says quietly that the fish below ought to be Pakistan green and made from smooth crystal chips. Even against his weighty shuffle, he hears a pen nib scritch into memo paper somewhere in the darkness where no wishes go unanswered. Why just a sneeze? Why not a bless you for a cough? Why don't devoutly religious, vaguely spiritual, or even irreligious people murmur bless you when you hack up phlegm in line at the bank? Why do total strangers need to invoke the mercy of God for someone else's quick, convulsive explosion of air and saliva when we don't after we see someone else fall on the sidewalk and hit their head on a mailbox? or stub their toe, hopping and screaming and crying? Why doesn't the sneezer instead bless everyone in the vicinity, since he is the perpetrator? Those innocent bystanders have been showered with and are now inhaling the sneezer's aerosol carnival of potentially disease-ridden mucous membranes. Why do we cling to the notion from the Middle Ages that a sneeze is potentially life-threatening and requires divine intervention when we know that almost no one dies after sneezing, but they do after falling down a flight of stairs? Still, you'll never hear anyone say bless you at the foot of those stairs, so why just a sneeze? <laughs> Every morning I kill 10,000 angels. I don't mean to, but they're everywhere. I crush a couple as I roll over in bed. Then a few more expire as I set down my cereal bowl. Scores are drowned in the shower and a couple dozen strangled in my shoelaces. And once I'm on the internet, they course over the cliff edge by the hundreds, plummet and are crushed despite their wings. I don't blame myself exactly. But still, I wish I had never had the thought that every second is another angel. One more blessed chance to get something right, or to find a thread of thought, original or not, and spin it into something unexpected. It seemed a pleasant conceit at the time, but now it only leaves me with carnage, remnants of white fluff everywhere. 
and I haven't even told you yet about the afternoons. The Canork, or the little-known history of the silent K preceding the letter N. If you wonder why the K sound trembles in silence when followed by N in most common parlance, attend to the story of the boisterous Knork and what happened to it many years before pork. The Knork was a beast with the odor of rot that captured its foes and tied them in canots, and then it devoured the humans it mauled from teeth to toenails and knickers and all. It is true the Knork grew up amid blight, where a banjo was played all day long by a canite. And banjos, one hears, have a certain knack for driving some mad and out of their sack. The Knork had a fear that tormented and torqued. It was a terror of having himself called a Nork. For the Knork loved its K-sound to ring from the rafters and not be absorbed by the N that came after. But town folk so wanted the K sound to be banished, for it reminded them that the Knork was unvanquished. It was agreed that the beast should be silenced and forked. A death canal should sound for the crafty Knork. But to Kanaka Knork is to strike with a poof, since its skull is as thick as an oxen's back hoof. So the ruling came down from experts who boasted that they studied Knorks, and the law was thus posted. Should you spy a Knork coming over a hill, do not pull a knife nor scream something shrill. Just remain still and quiet and rename yourself K. For the Knork fears nothing more than a mute, silent K. And facing a world where silent Ks are ideal, the Nork knew he had to knuckle under and kneel. And so now every K sound has been muffled, oh bless it, when followed by N, except the Israeli Knesset. I gotta go. No, really, I gotta go. See, I was drinking at the party, you know, not too much, but just enough to stay fluid with the conversation, and it never occurred to me that I should go to the bathroom, because if you don't need to go, why leave the party? So I didn't. And sure, there was a little pressure down there when I was saying my goodbyes, but they were laughing at the thing I said earlier about when that thing happened, so I didn't want to go to the can. And then I forgot... And so I leave, and I'm driving down the street. No, oh, yeah, there's definitely pressure down there, and I think I should go back to the party and take a leak. But I just said my goodbyes, and if I go back now, they'll say, oh, you're back, and I'll say, yeah, I gotta pee, and it'll be embarrassing, so I decide to keep driving. And now my car is rocking me back and forth, and it starts to feel like I'm gonna split and whiz right there on the seat. And I think, well, that's okay, it's just piss. Oh, but then I wonder about the smell, and will that ever come out of the car seat? And maybe even the carpet? Because I know of like a major municipal sized reservoir of urine and it's not sloshing anymore because there's no more room left and now it starts to make my back ache and I think that's not a very good sign that's a whole different part of my body so I start looking for a gas station where they have a john but I drive by one because it looks kind of grimy because I don't want to use one of those toilets where you have to kind of hover above the seat because there are things on that seat that can't be wiped off and I need to be sitting because when this one cuts loose small villages may be swamped and I'm sorry Sorry, but I can't be held responsible for an out-of-control natural function. So I keep driving, and now I'm pounding on the steering wheel and trying not to breathe because every breath just ratchets up the pressure down there, and I just want to piss so bad. And then I'm driving on a deserted street, and I think I should get out and pop a squat against a wall and pee on the sidewalk, but I'm afraid of splattering my shoes and blood. Plus, a cop car could come by and nail me with their goddamn spotlight, and then I'll be sitting in a precinct for the next few hours as the officers keep looking over at me, shaking their heads and laughing, so I decide to keep driving. And finally, finally, I'm on my street, and I'm counting down the houses. Four, three, two, and then I'm in my driveway, and I'm so excited I hit the gas and I jam on the brakes so hard my bladder hits the tight seat belt and makes a sound like smacking a vinyl couch with a tennis racket. Or maybe I just imagine it does. So I roll 
roll out of the car, teetering like a kid's pull toy, taking tiny little steps, because I don't want to spill now that I'm so close. And I stick the wrong key in the lock, and I scream at the key, and I stick the right one in, get inside, drop my pants around my ankles, tip myself onto the john, and pee for three hours straight. Or maybe I just imagined it. No, it was three hours. Straight. I was a male impersonator for 40 years. No, not like a drag king, not that kind of thing. No highness to the lowness I was feeling. See, I was born in 1945, four months after FDR died, two days after the end of World War II, 20 years before the invention of Doritos. We're talking a long, long time ago. So everybody's happy back then, and so am I. I mean, for the first five years, I'm down with it all, drooling, learning how to walk and talk and crap into a porcelain chair. Hey, I got this. Then boom! I'm five years old in 1950. Kindergarten, boys here, girls there. Whoa. Say what? Boys? Girls? When did we get divided into teams, and why wasn't I consulted about this? And I'm on what team? The boy team? Oh, hang on, we gotta talk about this. Oh, but nobody's talking. They just shove me into a stiff pair of blue jeans, hand me a Roy Rogers rifle, and say, Be a man, little man. Be a man? Be a man? How can I be a man when I don't even know how to be a person yet? Hey, I just got done figuring out peekaboo. And now I gotta be a little man because I got this thing down here? Really? Really? This? This is like way less than 1% of my total body weight, and it's gonna determine how I live the rest of my life? Seriously? Seriously? Oh yeah, they're serious. I can see that. And I know if I tell them I'm really a girl, it's gonna go bad for me. See, this is the early 1950s. And they weren't messing around with gender and shit. There was no, oh, you have a gender identity problem? Please tell us. It was, you be who we tell you you are. Or you're in deep trouble, little man. This is going on your permanent record. And if you don't come around, we're gonna hook up your skull to some jumper cables and run a few thousand ready kilowatts from your frontal lobe down to your brainstem until we fry us up a nice, calm, obedient boy. Hey, so I shut the heck up and I hide inside my plaid short sleeve shirts as I click off the mile markers. Boom. Ten years old. I'm a boy who doesn't talk much because I'm afraid of making a mistake and letting people see who I really am. Boom. Twenty years old. I'm a young man drinking hard and protesting the Vietnam War. Boom. Thirty years old. I'm a married man with a child. Boom. 40 years old. I'm an advertising executive man with a red sports car and I'm suicidal because the girl, the woman inside me, is dying. I feel her dying. She's been waiting for 40 years and now she's dying. And my male impersonator act is dying and I'm dying way before my time and then boom, I'm 45 in 1990 and I say that's all. I won't die in a rented room wearing borrowed clothes. I will not be what you want and I won't bleed for what you need. You cannot supersede me or impede me because I'm no longer weak need. so you can speed read the end of this screed. I am Christine. I am Christine. I am Christine. <laughs>